Hello folks, it's Lilia back here and I'm here with you today with a completely new format of a video. So what we're going to see today is a video interview I did with a colleague of mine whose name is Rory and Rory is a teacher from Cambridge in the UK who specialises in teaching Cambridge exams and he also does courses for learners you know things like that where he shares some of his fantastic strategies on how to do exams. So in this video chat we recorded via Skype um, we really want to share with you some of our best tips well mainly Rory I'm doing the um, Oprah's part here. Um, so in this video, Rory is going to share with you guys how to strategize for exams, especially when it comes to doing speaking and use of English. And very importantly, we're going to answer some of the most hot burning questions that you guys ask all the time. So we all want to know which accent we should stick with. Should we go for a British accent or American accent? Is it okay to speak with an American accent while you're doing your Cambridge exam? Because we all associate Cambridge exam with the UK, consequently the British version of English. So we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about strategizing very well because this is something Rory specializes in when he's teaching. And Rory is a great person, you know, he's got a fantastic and a very open-minded personality. Without further ado, let's get down to the video. Just before we get the ball rolling, I want to tell you guys that if you expand the description box down below, you will find Rory's details down there. So you can go to Rory's YouTube channel and subscribe to this channel because he usually talks about things that are fairly specific in the context of exams. So he very often talks about nailing, use of English, keyword transformations. He also talks quite a lot about listening. And I find this really unique about a YouTube channel because most YouTube bloggers like myself like to talk about doing your speaking and writing but very rarely do we focus on mastering our listening and grammar and reading and use of English skills when it comes to Cambridge exams. Don't forget to give this video a massive like and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to find out more about exams and just mastering your English or teaching English if you're planning to become an English teacher or if you are already one. So let's get straight to business. Hello Rory. Well, um, am I pronouncing your name the right way? You are. Am I pronouncing your name the, the right way? Yeah, I think so. So, you're an English teacher and you specialise in exams and you also create courses for English learners. So, could you just tell us briefly what brought you into teaching English in the first place? Sure, sure. So, I started teaching English when I used to live in Italy. Um, I lived in Milan for a couple of years and I actually started just teaching English to try and earn a bit of money to pay for my rent while I was living there. I'd never, I'd never tried it before. And then, yeah, I started teaching a couple of, um, a couple of boys that lived really close to where I lived just with commute, just with conversation. And it was really, really, I just realized I, I loved it. I really enjoyed it. And so from there, I just started teaching more and more, realized I liked it, um, did a course, teaching English course. And then I moved back to the UK. And then I started working online and, and specializing in these courses and building these courses. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So I guess you should have developed this interest for teaching exams in particular, because exams are fairly specific both format and skill-wise, so people have to do things they don't normally get to do in their real life when they talk to people, they don't have to fill in any keyword transformations or anything. So can you just um, tell me a little bit what brought you into teaching exams? Where, where did your interest originate actually? Sure, so I started teaching exams at uh, a language school that was near my house in the UK. And I actually didn't know very much about the exam side of things until I started teaching at that school. And the person who I was teaching with, she was, she told me that, you know, to, firstly, it's really good for people just to have, they, they come to the UK. So most of the people I was teaching would come to the UK for six months or a year as an au pair or something. And it was really nice for them at the end of the year to actually have something to show that they've been to England. They've obviously learned English, but they actually have a have something that can pr that proves it as well. And she was explaining this to me one day, and I was like, "That's a very good point. It's really true. It's nice just to have 
like something just to to show you visibly that you can see your language has improved and then so that's why that's why I started to take an interest at first and then I realized that actually having these qualifications is is a lot bigger than that as well I mean you can do so many things with these Cambridge exams well with with a lot of English exams but the one the ones I teach are the B2 first uh, which is also known as FCE or first certificate and C1 advanced or CAE exams and I, re I, I started to research them more and more and I realized that you can do a lot of things with these exams you can travel the world or get a, a lot of the people I was teaching were trying to get into universities or even even get a better job and the exams just they open doors I could say it like that to more places yeah yeah they absolutely do open doors for people you know to carry on with their lives and professional development and whatever we choose to do generally as non-native speakers of English exactly and, and I also realized when I was teaching them that I mean we were using course books to help the students learn and I realized that with these course books what you can do is is you can well this is why I designed my courses because they were all teaching the grammar and the vocabulary and everything but I realized there wasn't anything that really s focused on the strategy for learning how to pass these exams. And so I thought, right, I'm going to design something that actually teaches the students the strategy. Because I also figured having private lessons is quite expensive a lot of the time. Um, group lessons may be cheaper and, and not everyone can actually afford to do it. So I thought if I can teach students the strategy of what they should be doing, which is exactly what I was teaching my students in the classroom anyway. I would, I would actually spend most of the time saying, you know, this is the best way to pass this section of the exam. This is the best way to do that. And I realized if I can teach that in a, in a video course, then I can actually kind of show students how to, how to, how to teach themselves to pass the exam in a way. So that's, uh, yeah, so that, that's what I tried to do. So all of, all of the courses that I started to create until now have just been, strategy courses and explaining where to get the best resources um, and how to use those resources effectively to, to help themselves study. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Was there a part in the exam which required the presence of another person, um, for example in CPE or in CAE or in FC, well basically anything except for IELTS, you need to talk to another person, like I mean not only the examiner but you also have to interact with the partner. Do you think this is a part which, which you can practice on your own? Are there any strategies that you share in any of your courses or do you think people just need to have a little bit of um, teaching, uh, you know, specifically on that part where they have to interact with another person? It's a really good question, it's a really good question. I think there are um, strategies you can employ that will help with this. I don't think there's anything that can completely replace just speaking with another person and practicing. That's the, that's the best you can do for those specific parts of the exam. But there are definitely a couple of things you can do which will really help with those sections. Um, and in these exams, a lot of the time, which is, which is also why I focus on strategy, the the examiner that they when they're marking the exams as much of the marking and what they're looking for is how is the candidate answering the question rather than the language themselves they're saying you know are they ticking this box are they ticking this box which isn't necessarily to do with the language it's to do with how they can communicate and how they how they talk so in this section that you asked me about where you're talking with another candidate it's about how you how you link your idea to their idea before and so I teach in, in my courses little things like um, when you're listening to what this candidate is saying try to try to just pick up the one topic that they say and then just do simple things like show that you're agreeing with them and give and, and so I'll go through and I'll say you know you can actually use this phrase here no matter what the other candidate has said, you can always say this as a response. And and so even if you're not with another candidate practicing, if you have this in your mind, okay, when I do get to sit down with another candidate, I can just say this phrase. And the and immediately the examiner will just tick that box. Okay, so yeah, they've covered that little bit there. Yes, you can prepare 
by yourself. It's better, I think, if you're able to practice with another person. But if you can't, there are definitely ways you can you can help yourself as well in your own time. Oh, thank you so much for dealing with that, Rory. Well, I'm very sure that people watching right here, right now, who are watching this video and think, okay, so I can't really afford to do, you know, to, to have any private tutoring or I can't attend a language school or anything like that. And but I, I'm really willing to do an exam, you know, to, to see how well I can do it. And there is another question that learners ask me all the time in this channel, and I thought maybe you can help me tackle this one. So very often people um, are concerned with vocabulary use because people um, who are planning to take an exam try to cram in a lot of vocabulary. And very often when you are in an exam situation, it's very hard to, you know, to come up with beautiful phrases or expressions. And very often, when people try, when people try to say something sophisticated or highbrow, they just end up sounding really contrived because that proverb or that phrase does not necessarily fit the question or anything like that. If you know what I mean. So um, many learners are a little bit unsure what type of vocabulary they should stick with, whether they should really strive um, to use a beautiful phrase every now and then, or they should um, rather go with the flow and try to be more natural. So what would be your opinion on that? My good, good question again. My advice would be to just try and be, try and be natural. Um, I think if you're stu if you spend some time studying for the exam anyway, beforehand, then you will pick up phrases and things that that you will naturally use every now and then in a in a, in the context of an exam. But if you're deliberately trying to focus on using those phrases and vocabulary, it can just add a lot of pressure onto yourself in the exam, which I don't think is a good thing. I think actually, if you can somehow stay relaxed or more relaxed without that pressure, I think that students will perform better and naturally end up using a couple of phrases and things which, which will be really important and really good ones to use in the exam without deliberately trying to, to force them. Saying that, there are certain types of phrases that I think students should focus on more if they can. Um, so, for example, linking words and linking phrases, when the examiners are marking the exams, um, they look for not only the vocabulary, which, which your students have asked you about, it has a little part to play, but also the, the how you structure answers is quite important, and how you link the ideas that you have. So what you can do is you could learn just a few of these linking phrases and that could be a really useful thing. So maybe it doesn't need to be the most fantastic vocabulary in the world, but if you can practice the flow of your talking more, that's actually more important. And how you link your ideas together is really important as well. Does that answer your question? It's just... Yeah, absolutely. And I, this is something I advise uh, the learners who talk to me about this to do as well, because I think, well, being natural is way more important than just trying to inject a phrase that does not necessarily fit the context and it's spoiling and ruining the impression of yourself as a proficient speaker because when we talk how often do we actually use any idioms well sometimes we do but only provided that those um, expressions really suit the context of what we have at the moment yeah. so exactly i think a lot of the time the examiners what yeah. they're just looking for how well you can communicate with another person that's ultimately what it, what it comes down to is can this person have a have a normal conversation with another person and when we're having normal conversation as you said i'm not throwing in fantastic idioms all the time but we're just having a fairly easy to follow and coherent conversation and and that's what is the most important thing at the end of the day yeah. Well, and very often learners have another concern that has to do with exams quite a lot. So sometimes we get, you know, this whole range of strange topics that we have to talk about. Um, well, I, I particularly remember one topic where there was like a boy and, and a, part, a couple of other people swimming somewhere. You know, we're just a uh, boy swimming in a pool, a guy swimming um I don't know, like in a pond or anything like that. And there was a question like, uh, what do you think these people might be thinking while being in water? 
and this is like rather an otherworldly question to me so many learners are afraid that if they don't have anything in their experience that they can directly link to the subject in question they will immediately fail or they won't, that they won't produce you know they won't make the right impression so do you have any tips having to do with that yeah i do i know what you mean because sometimes the especially this which is um part two of the of the speaking task when you have these two different pictures and you have to compare them they can be really abstract and just quite strange pictures and i've seen many students suddenly they don't know what to say you know how do i how can i relate to this picture and what i say is actually one of the one of the most important tips in in my course on speaking actually is that what you can do is you can think of topics beforehand which you can apply to pretty much every different situation that you are faced with. <clears throat> so I say, for example, to my students, think about how, and, and normally there's a question above, but you can, you can take one topic. So I say, think about money, for example. How could money relate to this situation in any way? And because the more important thing is actually to compare the two photographs, you can actually apply a topic like money to both the normally most of the time to both pictures or for example is this person alone or are they with other people and in most of the pictures that you've come or that i've come across you can actually say okay is this person alone is he with other people and then that idea allows you to immediately compare the two photographs because maybe maybe they're both alone in the two pictures but you can still say okay this person's alone here and also this person's alone here and you're still comparing them but in this situation you're giving a similarity and the, the similarities and differences are the most important things but if you come up with a couple of those topics beforehand then no matter what even if you freeze and you think oh, i have no idea what to say about anything okay are they alone or are they with someone else it immediately gives you something that you can start to talk about yeah, well, that sounds like a valid approach to tackling this task, really, which many learners actually struggle with because very often, you know, we get bombarded with techniques via the internet and very often we have this, you know, we end up having this mixture of techniques in our heads and we don't really know which techniques to, um, you know, to, to go for when we're in, in an actual exam situation. And it's really great that you share some of those practical ideas with me and the people here of you who are watching this channel so I'm very thankful to you Rolly for doing this and there is also another question if you don't mind me asking you this so many learners um, get really confused because we associate um, Cambridge exams with British English and um, learners tend to think that if you speak American English you know um, you'll be you know uh, you'll be just generally uh, not given the grade that you want to get and very often learners think that if they just go to go if they're going to take an exam they don't speak British English they just might get lower grades or anything so what would you say um, in terms of pronunciation to to the people who are watching because generally I think pronunciation is one of those very delicate issues that many people are not very comfortable talking about so do you have anything to say to that yes yeah, so to, just Going back to the American or British English, um, it doesn't really matter if you speak in the exams, if you speak in American English or British English. The more important thing is that if you are using American English, just try to keep it in American English rather than swapping between the two. And it's the same for writing, for example. So the writing part of the exam, sometimes American English is a little bit different to British English. Maybe they don't put a U in, in an adjective when British people do, or maybe they use a Z rather than an S. The more important thing is if you just keep it consistent. So if you've come from an American-speaking school or from an American-speaking background and you do speak American English, it's fine. Just try to stay in... Just don't try to swap from American English to British English. I was going to say about pronunciation, it's something that people are really concerned about. Um, but again, I wouldn't, you know, if you can, it's a difficult thing to, to practice beforehand. There are some ideas that I've told some students before 
listen to specific podcasts and things like this. But I wouldn't say it was a major concern. I mean, it, it comes into the speaking exam. It is important, obviously. But again, I would more for, if it's a real concern of yours and you think, oh, I have terrible pronunciation, you can focus a little bit more on that when you're preparing beforehand. But again, I would say as long as you're ticking the other boxes, like being able to have a normal conversation with, with a person, being able to link your ideas, and things like this, as long as you're across the board ticking most of those boxes, then the pronunciation won't be as big an issue. And, and, and you can actually change the examiner's mind slightly about something. If they, maybe, they, maybe you don't have great pronunciation, but you're fantastic in this other part of the exam, then the opinion of an examiner can, can naturally shift a little bit. So as lo, I would say as long as you're quite good across the board, that is the most important. Yeah, that's very true. Plus, I think it's also very important what goal you have. If your goal is just to, to get a good grade, you know, to, to, you know, to pass your exam with flying colours, what you could focus on is, you know, we would have to do more with vocabulary and just, you know, being, being understood, being comprehensible, because I think if people just pay too much attention to trying to sound like a native speaker, they might just end up sounding completely incomprehensible, very hard to understand. And because, you know, we, we all have different hearing ability and I think but just uh, some people want to have a good pronunciation like I spend quite a lot of time working on a mic pronunciation because I teach learners around the world so I do want to uh, present my learners with um, a clear version of English um, as far as I can feel it but I think if you're an exam candidate and you're working towards um, doing an exam and passing an exam with a good grade I think um, I would recommend just like you have Rory. Uh, well just here um, just to sum up I just have another question and um, I hope uh, I hope that um, we have something to offer to our uh, viewers on this one. So many people say that um, Cambridge exams lack objectivity and what they mean by that is that um, quite a lot of learners are fairly proficient if you just talk to them in real life but when they start doing their exams they score B um, or they may just get a C you know in their speaking or in their writing even though if you just talk to them they sound super fluid they sound like a native speaker there's nothing you can just add or anything you can help them to master in terms of their English but when they do exams um, they just get lower grades partly because they you know just read behind the lines or anything like that you know and it's really frustrating to learners when everyone tells them how proficient they are, but when they do an actual test, they don't score as highly as they wanted. So would you say that that might be the case? Do you think Cambridge exams still have room for improvement? There is a direction where they can change, you know, to create this room for subjective or anything like that. So I would really appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, I mean, part of the reason why I spent so much time in my courses is that I, I realized that a massive part of passing these exams is not actually how good your English is, but it's how do you answer the question? What technique, what technique or what strategy do you use? And a lot, a lot of the time, what I realized with these exams is that the strategy is just as important as your language itself, if not more important. And it's a really, really good question because maybe maybe it shouldn't be so strategy based in the exam maybe they should change the way they mark the, the papers a little bit and the way they mark candidates a little bit um to try and make it a bit more focused on general everyday english i think that's a that's a really good idea um yeah so i think there probably is room for improvement in in terms of how they mark the exams maybe that maybe there's something maybe they do mark the exams in a specific way for a reason which I don't know about. There could be something else going on, but from from my point of view and probably from your students' point of view, they they I think they could change it just to just to sort of um, yeah evaluate people in a bit more on their on their general everyday English as opposed to how is he specifically answering this question. Um, 
But unfortunately, at the moment, it is very strategy, strategy based, and that that is why I made my courses to help students with that. Because as you said, you can have someone who's really, really good at English; they have a great knowledge, and but they just don't know the correct way to to answer a question. So, for example,、um, we were talking earlier about the the speaking part where there's two different photos. Someone could have amazing English, but they could just describe what they're seeing in the photo. And then they won't get very good marks because that task is not about describing what you see in the photo, but it's actually about comparing and contrasting. So it's really interesting, really interesting question, and、um, yeah, maybe in the maybe in the future they will change a little bit. But yeah, yeah, interesting point. Well, yeah, well, just so many fantastic ideas. That our learners can get their hands on, and I think I totally appreciate what you're saying here today, sharing with the Smith or community mind. Well, just we totally appreciate that, and I'm sure many people will get in touch after this interview, after the video is released, to to tell us if they have managed to put any of those practical ideas into practice after the video, after watching the video. So, just on a finishing note, Rory,、uh, do you think you could share any、uh, very practical resources? I mean, like I know that some of those you share in your course, and those are really original.、Uh, but like, do you think there there is anything that you would be happy to share with the learners? Something they could just do straight away after watching this video, possibly today or later on this day, they're preparing for an exam. You know, maybe podcast or a book they could read. I mean, like fiction or watching a documentary that is particularly relevant to the exam skills that we're talking about right now. Yeah, so I like my, I myself have a YouTube channel, and there's loads of free strategy videos and tips on there, which I would always say, you know, go go there because I think、well, that stuff's really good.、Um, but if we take me out of the equation,、uh, yeah, there are some useful things. Fortunately, a lot of them you have to you have to pay for certain resources, but. I think what what I what I do sometimes is I just type in into Google search or whatever.、Um, one of the books I use a lot with my students is Ready for First is the name for the FCE exam, or Ready for Advanced is the one for CAE. And I'll just type that in and Google, and then type PDF afterwards. And a lot of the time you can just find maybe a slightly older version of the book in a PDF copy on the internet, and then you can. Straight away, have access to loads of information. So, I can't remember the specific web addresses of these right now, but that is something I would definitely do. Just type the name of a book and then PDF. Just to、uh, just to round off this video, I was just really、um, wanting to、um, ask you this.、Um, so, how how do you think learners could access you if you would be happy to、um, answer their questions? I talk about the courses you have. So. How do you think people could get in touch with you after watching this video, if、uh, you know they have any further exam ideas to talk about? Would you、sure. be happy to chat with us? Yeah, of course I would. Yeah.、Um, so I have a a YouTube channel where there's a discussion tab where I think people can write to each other. I'm quite new to YouTube, so I'm not sure exactly how that works at the moment.、Um, but I also have a website which is studentlanguages.com. And students can go on there. There's a chat box, or also, you know, feel feel free to send me an email.、Um, I would say my my email address is admin at studentlanguages dot com. Maybe we could write it in the in the description with the video. I'd be perfectly happy to do that. And if any students have any questions or anything, I'm really more than happy to help. So, yeah, feel free to feel free to get in touch. Super. Thank you so much. I think I'll I'll leave your details in the description box under this video down below. So if、I、just go to the description box, if you open the any spam, they do also find Rory's details there, and you can access his courses and see what the courses are like, and generally everything like that. So I'm really thankful to you, Rory, for joining me today and talking to the audience. And、um, I'm so happy to have you here and have this opportunity to talk to you myself because very often living in Ukraine, I feel I don't have、um, an opportunity to interact with that many native speakers these days as I、um, would wish I could. So thank you very much for taking your time to 
talk to me today. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you, Lily. Thank you for, for talking with me. And yeah, I hope, I hope that some students find this really, really useful. That's the main thing. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much, guys, for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. So after this video, I would probably recommend that you write down quite a few tips that you remember and don't forget to apply them because it's all about practice. It doesn't really boil down to listening to theory and doing all of this mental masturbation, but just, you know, putting the theory into practice and seeing how you can apply the tips and techniques Rory was very kind to share with us in this video um, in your real life and in your exam preparation. As you see, you can prepare for an exam on your own if you can't afford to pay for a private tutor or attend um, a, a language school where you can study English in a group. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel by clicking on a little bell down below and please give this video a like and I'll see you very soon in my next video. Bye!